uh, Mr. Nekov, the uh, distinguished guests and hosts and colleagues. So I'd like to start with just a very short two, two, okay. just a very short few words about, about Canada. So it's a very big country, but perhaps not such a large population. Uh, very much concentrated in a few provinces that also have the largest cities. Um, employment runs around the OECD harmonized rate, but as you can imagine in such a large country, we have significant uh, regional variations depending on the, the regional economy. Uh, what makes Canada perhaps a little different than some of the other countries that we've, we've talked about so far is the rate of immigration to Canada. Um, we a quarter million new immigrants to Canada every year. And you can see that relative to the births per year, it's actually quite a high proportion of our population growth comes from immigrants. In fact, on a per capita basis, Canada takes in twice as many immigrants in a year as the United States. In terms of our employment, uh, programs. They're very similar to what we've heard from Bulgaria and some of the other countries, that we have a national system. The national system is entirely self-financed by employers and workers. So there is an income replacement segment at the top, and then there is obviously training and employment assistance. And these are broad-based programs that um, are national in scope and attempt to take in most of most workers and then there are some very small programs that are additional programs for at-risk groups and they are typically uh, funded by the federal government but um, the delivery of the programming is either by provinces or territories or sometimes by community groups So what unites all the programs, there's a very similar theme to them. It's all about quick returns to work. And I don't know how well the, the statistics show up, but we see that the number of people receiving income benefits, uh, that's, the, that's the purple line on the graph. So there are three aspects to this, that anyone who is receiving employment insurance and the uh, period of benefits is not as generous as what is available in some other countries. Um, they, are, they have very strict job search responsibilities and they have incentives to accept any work, even if it is short term. So their benefits, they do get, get to keep their benefits, even if they're only able to find work for a few days a week, there's an evening out. Um, there are substantial but quite targeted investments in training, um, a heavy reliance on labor market information to target the training. Uh, labor market information isn't perhaps at quite the same level that we see in some of the European countries. It's, we've uh, for a long time had sort of 13 separate systems of labor market information plus a national one. And they have, the last two years, there's been great efforts to integrate everything. And uh, there's also in the tax system support for people who have to move to take up another job. We have a very mobile um, workforce actually in Canada. So within this integrated national approach, there is also a recognition that at the local level, it is necessary to design and deliver programs that really reflect local needs. So that's sort of a three, part, three parts to that coordination, that the levels of government coordinate with stakeholders, employers are encouraged to uh, contribute to the development of, of uh, training programs at colleges, for example, so that colleges are quite um, nimble in reflecting the needs of employers and providing the training, and that communities are also involved, not just in delivering programs, but in also uh, feeding into the system about what is needed. So this, this system has served us quite well for a long time. Um, 
but we're sort of at a watershed now where we need to replace workers leaving the workforce and openings due to economic growth. So we're looking at about six million job openings in the next few years. And as we see, a very similar um, age, aging population, perhaps not as much as, 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 or as rapidly as in other countries, but it is coming. Certainly in the northwest of Canada, um, along the, it's a very young population, but along the east coast, we see an o older population. And um, labor, labor force growth accounts for two thirds of Canada's economic growth. So this is a really a big, big issue. And as you see, we this year hit the fir for the first time in after 150 years of continuous labor force growth that older workers or older Canadians are now outnumbering children. So as we're hearing from everybody else that uh, older people are working older, the, and why? Because they have improved health and life expectancy higher levels of education. In fact, 42% of 55 to 64 year olds in Canada have a post-secondary education. We also have no mandatory retirement age and legislation prohibits uh, discrimination on the basis of age. So most older workers are actually doing quite well and they don't need help from the public employment service. As you can see, we have increasing participation rates, especially among women. And unemployment among older workers is actually much lower than the Canadian average. But the picture isn't completely positive. As I mentioned before, some rural areas in particular uh, have higher concentrations of older workers, and these typically are areas that are dependent on primary industries such as fishing, trapping, logging, that are in decline. Um, we find immigrants that come into the labor force at an older age, they are particularly disadvantaged compared to younger immigrants. And uh, as we've heard with other countries, those with, uh, with lower levels of education have a much higher rate of unemployment. And those who lose the, leave their jobs because of disability or chronic illness have a hard time getting back to full employment. So generally, the employment uh, programming, the, the sort of umbrella programming I talked about, serves the needs of most older workers. Um, there's the help help to enter or re-enter the workforce, the sort of counseling. We have a program called the Canada Job Grant that uh, um, helps employers provide training for people looking for a job that they think they would like to take in. We have the types of programs that we see prevent unemployment, uh, again, training, uh, supports for literacy, uh, literacy with priority to low-skilled individuals, and then for people who need to find a new job, the employment insurance uh, system. But there is a recognition that certain older workers need special support. And these are typically the people who are facing multiple barriers. And frequently, they're also the people that live in small, isolated communities that have very limited employment alternatives. And we've had a history. We've seen a shift over time. In the 1970s and 1980s, when the baby boomers offered a la ample labor supply and there were cycles where unemployment in Canada was relatively high, there was a tendency to just bridge people over to age 65, when, uh, which is the normal retirement age and pension age in Canada. So basically to give them um, bridging, bridging financing. And then, as we saw in the late 90s, when we started to see really shortages in the labor market and just generally a shift to activation type policies, again, this was mirrored in, in, uh, in the programming as well. And we see an evolution where each program kind of built on the lessons learned 
from the previous programming and to where we are now, which is the targeted initiative for older workers. So this is really a very small program and it's very, very targeted funding. So it's about small groups and peer support, hands-on practical training and work experience, which research shows us is what works best for older workers. The federal government is the minority, is the majority funder. It provides 70% of the funding. Then the provinces and territories select communities that they think need this type of programming and develop the projects. Um, and the communities themselves pull resources together and decide what it is they need and who the people are that need the help. So the, probably the, the best part about TO is that it's like a menu. It can't hear? I'm sorry. Is there a problem with the translation? No? It's OK? OK. It is that it really offers community almost like a menu that they can choose from. Um, it, it evolves for each participant based on what they need. So on average, although the, a project is only required to offer two employment activities, um, it usually averages out that each participant takes 10 activities. And that compares to on the uh, broad stream employment programs, usually someone who goes into an employment center gets about two activities. So. We can see the sort of the, I think it's pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory. The essential skills is often a big one and mentorship plays a huge role because uh, as we've heard from other people, often older workers have had a long time working in one industry and lack confidence in, in facing the sorts of changes that are necessary. So it's a small program. So actually, uh, I just got before I left the September statistics. So it's actually 39,000 people have been served through this. And what is quite amazing about the program is that 30% of participants don't even have a high school diploma when they go in. Half of them have been employed for 12 months or more. and. 60% of them live in communities that have unemployment rates of 10% or higher. And despite that, 75% of them found employment either during their period in the program, which is typically very short, or directly afterwards. And uh, employers like it too. Now I think, you know, for employers there is an incentive because there is a wage subsidy for people that are, are getting or work experience, but there's quite a high retention rate that employers keep the people after the subsidy ends. And also for the communities, there's a, a benefit in that the projects are usually customized to mesh with local economic development plans. So there's there's quite a tight, quite a tight relationship and mutual drawing of expertise between government, employers, education, and uh, community service providers. So it's, it's a program that we're always tweaking. There's always a back and forth going between all the levels. It was a temporary measure when it was introduced in 2006 and it was reviewed in 2008 and 2011 and 2014, this time for three years. So already the evaluation cycle is starting up again. So it, there is a really an effort to keep it relevant to changing needs. A lot of results tracking and analysis about what works. So there are actually three best practices that we, we see with TO, and one of them is really the connection with local employers. This is really, really the key to success. Um, you really a focus on community assets, employers' assets, and the innovative ideas that are suggested by people who work in the community. So all these pictures are actually from from uh, successful groups, and this is actually a, a group 
in Manitoba that was doing a, um, um, it's a, a mining, mining preparation course. So I have several examples, but I think I'm just going to really talk about this one that's a, that really shows, illustrates the building on local assets. And um, for those of you not that familiar with the Northwest Territories, it uh, has a, a, an area of 1.4 million square kilometers and a population of 43,000 people. So you can imagine that the um, providing services is difficult. We're talking about an area with many small communities that are accessible only by plane. Uh, the ice uh, in the winter prohibits even provision by ship. So um, we have 11 languages in the Northwest Territories. I mean, besides English and French, there's Dog Rib and Chippewan and Cree and Inuktitut. So you know that also complicates things. Um, people live to some extent still off the land, uh, hunting moose, fishing, gold and diamond mining is a, is a large industry there. Natural gas and petroleum exploration. So here's the project. A little square on the map shows where Uhulaktak is. And the population is 460 people, which is about a typical size of a community in the Northwest Territories. As you can see, it is fairly far north, even for Canada, and very high unemployment rate. <clears throat> One of the uh, issues with, with it is uh, obviously the remoteness. And it's a very rugged topography on the edge of that island. Um, in fact, um, it has actually led to the closing of mining operations because of the costs of supplying the mine there. <clears throat> so the working age, the wor employment rate of the working age population had sunk to about 43%. But it did have an extensive history of producing handicrafts and uh, prints and uh, carvings, um, uh, products made from muskox wool, soapstone and ulus, which is a type of a traditional knife and other items. And um, <clears throat> it, uh, they had been marketing on a small scale. But as you can see, it's not exactly a community you drive to just to pick up a, a gift for somebody. So the local uh, community decided to um, try to reestablish a craft center and sell items through the internet. Uh, it's not an a, a older worker group that uh, is very internet savvy. And a very small group of people, we're talking about five people, a 12-week program. So the emphasis was on self-employment based on local customs and tradition, and delivered in local languages. So they were trained to produce the handicrafts, but also computer skills, uh, photography, marketing techniques, and in addition, some first aid and CPR certification, a, um, a certification called Northern Host that, will, that you can use if you say want to uh, provide accommodation in a bed and breakfast type of uh, situation, and a lot of small business techniques. So it's actually worked quite well. The, um, the uh, co-op is now producing local handicrafts and wholesaling, um, wholesaling to other um, communities in the Northwest Territory, such as Yellowknife, where there tends to be a fair bit of tourism. It's worked very well for them. So it, uh, this is just another, the innovative design. It's, it's really about listening to the communities about what, would, what they think would work, and sometimes taking a bit of chance on something. And again, we have a, a yeah, in this case, um, it was a Aboriginal group, the Larange First Nation, and uh, they went out of their way to provide transportation for every participant to all the activities and provided a laptop for each participant so that they could really work on their computer skills and maintain them after the program. 
So in Canada, we see that uh, most older workers are, can be helped through the broad-based programs, but we do have a really tough-to-service group where age is interacting with other challenges, mostly lack of skills or living in a community with a low demand for labour. And it really is producing groups, small groups of people that are underutilized or disadvantaged at a time where we could really use every older worker. So it's a small program. It doesn't cost a lot, but it focuses on really high intensity help, targeted supports based on what is identified in the community as what they want. And uh, the keys to success have really been the practical training aspect and the individualized help and, and drawing re uh, supports from the community, not only during the program, but also after the program. I think where really the challenge, though, in it is the ongoing need to uh, educate employers and to promote, to promote more age-friendly policies and practices and intergenerational workplaces. And uh, one area that we do need to do more on is we see that older entrepreneurs who would like to give up their businesses are finding it very difficult to find young people to take them over. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Ramona McDowell. Really impressive it was your presentation. One of the best developed uh, uh, countries in the world uh, is able to develop and implement programs for 35,000 people and for five people. This is so very inspiring. We have 480 job seekers, let's say, and then uh, we can establish and implement a um, micro program instead of looking for macro program implementation in a small community. This is something uh, uh, very specific and very important for us. Um, now it's time for questions, opinions, remarks. Yeah, it was a very exhaustive presentation indeed, but still. Yeah, I, find it, I found it very inspiring. Thank you very much for this presentation. And I would like to ask one question regarding the training. What I got from your examples is that it can be uh, different from community, from community. And is it right what I also got then in general, uh, the vocational part of the training, not dedicated to gen more general skills like numeracy, literacy, or computer skills, tends to be rather short? Because that was also what we uh, discussed when we had the peer review, what to do best with low skilled and what is the difference between young persons and adults. And I think there is not so much difference between adults and older adults. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, typically, the training would not be more than 24 weeks in length. I think if somebody needs that type of extensive training, they would be... Um, served through the broader umbrella programs. Uh, typically also in small communities, there isn't access to longer term training. We're talking sometimes about bringing somebody in to, to provide training. If it's a, you know, a community like the one in the Northwest Territories, there isn't a community college there. Thank you. Other comments, questions? I don't see any. So, shall we jump into the next continent? <laughs>